Uh, thanks, Greg. So my name is Tim Huang. Very excited to be here as part of KMF. Um, and what I want to do over the next few minutes is talk a little bit about the role of sort of the media in shaping the future uh, of AI. Um, so it's easy to kind of get confused by all the terms that are flying around, right? What exactly is AI? What exactly is machine learning? And I think Craig's remarks are great because they kind of focus on the point that the sort of popular culture uh, around AI is actually a really important part of it, right? And at least to me, this is how I define AI, which is that it is this kind of broad, broad category, this sort of multi-decade dream of creating sort of um, intelligent machines, right? Uh, maybe not even decades, right? I think there's a good argument that it has been with us for a very long time. And part of the tricky thing about reporting on AI or thinking about AI or figuring out what our policies around AI should be um, is that there's this kind of smaller segment, um, which is the field of machine learning. And that's specifically the sort of field of computer science that's dedicated to creating algorithms um, that get better with more data. And what's weird is, you know, this is a little bit of a Venn diagram, actually. There are things that kind of fall into AI that use machine learning, these huge breakthroughs that have happened uh, in the last few decades. Um, and, uh, and, and we recognize them as AI, right? So when um, AlphaGo, the system that Google's DeepMind used to uh, win uh, a match against the World Go champion, won, that is a case of machine learning, and it's also a case of AI. But it actually turns out that there's lots of forms of machine learning that kind of don't fit into our category or something that we wouldn't automatically recognize as AI. So when you feed a check uh, into an ATM and it reads your handwriting and says, this is a check for $1,000, um, that handwriting recognition actually leverages machine learning. So you're probably saying, OK, this is fun but kind of wonky, and why are you telling me all of these semantics? And I think. The reason is that actually the public kind of soaks up these definitions, uh, and it leads to very interesting results in how people think about where AI even is. So this is a, a quick visualization from a public opinion survey that our initiative funded that kind of asks a statistically representative group of Americans just a simple question, right? Which is, given this object, do you think it contains AI, that's the purple line, uh, automation, that's the blue line, um, uh, uh, machine learning, that's the green line, or robotics, that's the, the red line, right? And you can see the percentages that pe people kind of respond to things, right? And, you know, automatically there's this interesting bias that emerges. So among, you know, driverless cars and trucks and social robots that can interact with humans, the public does a great job of recognizing what that is. They say, there's AI there, it contains these things, it's probably a kind of robotics, it's kind of an AI, it probably contains this thing called machine learning we've heard about. But what's interesting is if you look at the row above, right, uh, Google Translate, recommendations for Netflix movies or Amazon eBooks, the percentage is way lower, actually. And what's interesting is that all of these technologies are currently using machine learning. And so the public only recognizes that AI is existing in some places, but not others when it's actually in both places at the same time. So why is that relevant? Well, it's relevant because Basically, what we think about when we think about AI is everything under uh, the street lamp, right? And we only think about the parts of machine learning that kind of peek into uh, the light cast by this definition. And in fact, there's a lot of machine learning that just sort of exists outside of um, the kind of mental models that we bring to thinking about AI. So this has a couple of very real and very important implications for uh, how the technology is developed and deployed. For one, it really influences the kinds of public opinion that companies face when they deploy the technology. So some of you may have tracked this really interesting story that happened uh, in the past 12 months uh, of basically a number of Google employees uh, organizing to stop Google from providing their machine learning services, specifically computer vision, uh, to the US military. And you know, this is a case in which sort of an AI application was recognized and there was activism against it, right? And companies um, you know, use that as a data point. They say, well, okay, maybe, maybe we're gonna get you know, some bad press uh, if we try these types of applications. But the point is, is that there may be lots of uses of machine learning that we don't recognize as AI that make it very difficult to rally people um, to take action on you know, perhaps not so great uses uh, of the technology. So that's for one. Secondly, it actually also influences the kinds of policies uh, that we might come up with as well. So some of you may have seen this tweet from Bernie Sanders. I think there's a, a lot of indications that point to the idea that AI will become a really big 2020 election issue. But if we're only making uh, policies that apply to what we think of as AI versus this broader category of machine learning, we really might miss a lot of the implications or impacts uh, of the technology. 
So why is this? Well, one argument is that machine learning is really wonky. It's kind of a computer science thing. There's a, you know, a lot of sort of math. It can also be used in lots of different ways, right? I can use machine learning to recognize whether or not there's a, a cat in an image, or I can use that very same technology to determine whether or not it's a tank on the battlefield that the drone should drop a bomb on, right? And this is difficult because the technology appears in so many different places and it's kind of shrouded uh, in this jargon. And I think this actually points to the very important role that the media has to play in ensuring that the public's eyes are in the right place as this technology continues to develop. Um, I think a little bit about the work of Ida Tarbell uh, at the turn of the century investigating Standard Oil. And one of the sort of innovations or one of the accomplishments there was to say, hey, we have this big thing, Standard Oil, that is doing things in all these different places around the country, but actually all these things are linked, right? And that there is actually sort of an argument that can be made around um, this, this new kind of technological and business force uh, that we face. Um, and I think there's a similar need to do that today. Um, now, I think there's a question, which I think Julia will probably take up, which is the question of how do we investigate, right? Because I think the investigations that take place in this kind of context, um, you know, at this point over 100 years ago, look very different from the types of methodologies and practices we need to bring in uh, to investigating the AI of today.